I had the strangest roommates in my freshman year of college. Despite being otherwise normal, even a bit shy, Eddie would ever so often become frantically possessed by a sudden overwhelming need to lock the door. It didn't matter which door either. Wherever he was when the fit came upon him, he would leap up, run to the closest entrance, and lock it. People who stood in his way were screamed at. Anyone who tried to stop him would get attacked. He became a ranting, sweaty madman until his mysterious sense of vulnerability passed. But the moment he was gone, he would apologize profusely, sink timidly into himself, and scurry away embarrassed. For that reason, it was hard to hate him. But it became a little easier to despise him each time I returned home to find myself locked out. Similarly, each time I brought him to a party, he had one of his episodes. I inevitably lost potential romantic interests and friends because I was roommates with that Eddie guy. Halfway through the year, after the third almost girlfriend ghosted me because he scared the shit out of her, I put in for a dorm room transfer and washed my hands of the poor guy. That was almost seven years ago now. So when Eddie messaged me on social media and said he was in town and had to run into some travel issues, I decided to give him another shot. I'd always felt sort of bad about how I treated him in the end, so I drove half an hour out to his broken down car and picked him up around one in the morning on a normal Wednesday night three weeks ago. I remember pulling up to the edge of the high cliffside road to see a skinny silhouette waving at me. He was leaner than I remembered and somewhat more in shape. My headlights illuminated him fully, and I saw his face glisten, and I laughed. That was Eddie, all right. Sweat was sort of his hallmark. He hefted a duffel bag and ran to my passenger side before fiddling with the door handle repeatedly. Don't pull it when I'm unlocking it, I told him. He waited a tick. I pushed the button, and he tried the handle at the same time. Oops. Wait, I said again, hitting unlock as I did so. Okay, now. He finally got the door open and clambered in with a nervous laugh. <laughs> Sorry, man. His long legs folded up a bit as he got situated, and I could see his exposed ankles. Thanks for picking me up. I shrugged. It's no problem at all. Do you know what's wrong with it? <sighs> yeah, the alternator's been having trouble. I think the cold weather finally did her in. Cool. Cool. I gave a slight cough to clear my throat, and we drove in awkward silence until he brought up a joke from the past. Just like that, we slipped into that first semester seven years before, with all its new experiences, hilarious misadventures, and surprised pressures. By the time we reached my place, I had remembered the good things about him, and I was glad I decided to help him out. On the way in, I pointed to the couch. That's probably the best spot in the apartment trying to save money these days, so these places are pretty small. Rent these days, huh? He asked before placing his duffel bag down and sitting carefully on the couch to evaluate its softness. This'll do fine. I can't thank you enough. I'll get out of your hair in the morning as soon as the repair shop's open. It's no problem at all, Eddie. Actually, I go by Ed now. Good for him. He'd definitely grown as a person from the socially fearful outcast I remembered. I grinned. <laughs> then, no problem at all, Ed. I went to bed back in my room without a single worry. It seemed like his issues had been resolved by maturity or medication, and who was I to judge someone for trouble beyond their control? That was all in the past. Of course, I was completely wrong. Around... Four in the morning, I awoke and got up to get a glass of water from the kitchen. I knew my own apartment, so my footsteps were pretty much silent, but Eddie still sighed and stirred on the couch as if something was bothering him. I stood by the fridge, glass in hand, as he whimpered, struggled, and then leapt up. In a mad, terrified dash, he ran to my front door and slammed the deadbolt. He gave out a deep breath of relief and remained there with his head down while I tried to figure out the best way to let him know I was present. Well, if he was having a fit, there was no good way to do this. He seized up mightily, gasped in as much air as his lungs could hold, and then slowly turned around. 
His face was obscured in dimness, since the only light came from various red or green pinpoints on the television and microwave, but I could tell he was sweating profusely. After a long moment, he managed to breathe again. Finally, he said, Oh, hey, didn't see you there. Yeah. I put my glass down on the counter. You alright, dude? He meant his laugh to sound nonchalant, but it just came out nervous and high-strung. <laughs> uh, same old, same old. You know how it is. I went around the corner and approached him. He moved back a few steps and I touched the door. This is a safe neighborhood. There's nothing to worry about. He nodded awkwardly. Unsure I believed his calmness, I moved my hand at the deadbolt. I wanted to make sure he wasn't going to get weird while I was asleep if I went back to bed. He made a sudden half-hearted leap toward me, hand out. Don't! At that moment, I was starting to remember the times I'd seen him attack people during an episode. There's nothing out there. I gripped the deadbolt to turn it toward me, but a very slight shadow moved somewhere in my vision. The hell? No, it couldn't be. Reacting rapidly, I put my eye to the peephole. My brain made sense of the curved panorama, just in time to see a sliver of a silhouette disappear along the sidewalk to the left. Eddie moved closer, bringing the smell of his panicked sweat with him. Did you see something? No. I lied. I kept staring out through the people, watching the quiet night in my otherwise unremarkable neighborhood. The asphalt glimmered darkly under the stars, while distant lampposts cast long shadows across grass. Remind me again, what makes you so suddenly want to lock the door? Now that I wasn't actively trying to unlock it, he seemed slightly less manic. I... I never told you because I thought you were starting to hate me, but... When I was eight years old, I had a sudden feeling that I should lock the door. I didn't, and... Uh, some men broke in a moment later and robbed us. I frowned at his glistening, shadowed face. Jesus, was anyone hurt? He nodded between audible breaths. My mom? Another three breaths passed in the otherwise silent darkness. She, uh... She didn't make it. I didn't know what else to say. Just... Damn. No wonder. No wonder. Before I could elaborate, the sound of something skittering outside reached us. He turned and listened in one rapid motion like a startled animal, and I had to admit, I was none too calm either. Still, I couldn't risk amping up his anxiety. I did want to sleep again at some point. He whispered. Where was that? It sounded like it came from the back. I whispered too. I'm sure it's nothing. Let's go. I led the way and we crept through my apartment. He made sure to mimic my steps, but he was still louder than me and I nearly winced at every creak. By the time we entered my bedroom and reached the rear window, my nerves were raw. The windows are fitted with stops that prevented it opening all the way. I usually left it open for the breeze, even in the winter. We sat in total darkness in front of that thin, rectangle of cool air. Looking and listening, we sought any sign of what had made the noise. Have you ever actually listened to the sounds of the city at night? What I'd gotten used to as silence was actually anything but... Soft winds stirred a rustling in the nearby bushes. A train blew a horn in the unknown distance. A dog barked twice. Briefly, an ambulance siren tracked across the horizon. Under it all, a constant low, haunting wail. 
emanated across the world from the nearby highway. I'd always hated that noise whenever I'd accidentally become aware of it because I thought it sounded like a thousand ghosts screaming from very far away, but I wasn't about to tell Eddie that. It was about that time that my gaze landed upon something in the trees. When I'd first seen the closely bunched collection of white pinpoints, I'd assumed they were reflections from somewhere. Now, though, as I watched them carefully, I was nearly certain I was seeing them rotate upward. It was as if someone was spinning a wheel of lights whose narrow side was facing us. From the size and distance, the wheel must have been two or three feet in diameter. I whispered, What is that? After finding it with the help of my pointing finger, Eddie's stare deepened. I've never seen anything like it. What could that possibly be? I couldn't make sense of it. While I watched, it grew slightly dimmer, then slightly brighter. It's definitely casting light around it. I think I saw some leaves above it. Is it... changing? Eddie clenched to my wrist as he stared at those strange, upwheeling lights. Is it getting bigger? I couldn't be sure, but how could it be getting bigger unless... Jumping up, I placed my fingers on either side of the window and brought it down swiftly and quietly. Then I turned the latch and locked it before pulling a nearby cord and sliding the blinds down. Whatever it is, we're secure in here. We'll be fine. It's probably just some kids playing with light toys or something. He sighed and opened his mouth to speak, but a visible change came over the silhouetted contours of his head. An instant later, he leapt over and slammed my bedroom door shut. The boom echoed loudly in my ears. I demanded to know what he was doing as he locked my door. And he turned around and put his back to it. I could tell he was wild-eyed from the way he whispered. Be quiet. It's in your apartment. The adrenaline spike from the slammed door made me a little angrier than I wanted to be. What? What's in my apartment? His frantic whisper was nearly a hiss. I don't know. I just know that we have to keep this door locked. I was fuming, but if I spoke, I would have said something I regretted. So we stood there in the dark for a solid few minutes. I began to calm down as those minutes passed, and once I was in control again, I opened my mouth to whisper, Hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I... The floor creaked outside my bedroom. I froze. Eddie backed away from the door and faced it alongside me. It was nothing but a dark rectangle in front of us, but I stared at it for any hint of motion or change. The crazy thing was, I had no idea what I was even looking for or listening for. What could possibly have been out there? Not only had we left the front door locked, there had been no sound of entry, forced or otherwise. If there was someone or something out there, how had they gotten in? Dim light began to move across the walls of my room, and I waited for the sound of a passing car. But none came. As we watched the door, brighter light began to roll upward around us, again as if someone was spinning some sort of lit wheel. It didn't take long for us to realize that whatever we'd seen in the distance outside was growing closer to my window. Beyond the blinds, something was coming near, but neither of us dared to look away from a bedroom door for even an instant. And then, I saw it. Between moving lines of shadow and lights, I could have sworn my door handle had changed angles. I backed away. A look at the blinds showed definitive lights of spinning closer, as if they were right outside the window and about to come up against it. Grabbing Eddie by the shoulder, I pulled him with me into the tiny one-person bathroom. He closed and locked the door the instant we were inside. My heart 
was hammering in my chest to the point of actual pain. Grunting my whisper, I asked, What the hell is happening? He shook his head. I have no idea. Are you sure? I asked him, squeezing his wrists. This all started with that robbery and attack on your mom, right? No, he whispered back. My bathroom door was flush to the outside carpet, but hence a rotating light began to appear underneath, as if that insane, impossible wheel had somehow entered my room without opening or breaking the window. None of this made sense. It has to be you somehow. No. It has to be. I shook him violently. Is your fear of making it real? Is something after you? You don't understand, he whimpered. I didn't finish the story. It didn't start with that incident. I'd been getting the urge to lock doors years before that. The first time I didn't. That's when they came. I couldn't understand exactly what he meant. The robbers? He shook his head. Oh, God. They weren't robbers, were they? He shook his head again. My voice dropped to a razor hiss. What is out there, Eddie? All he could say was, They want in. Something about the way he said it finally made me understand. It's not about the bathroom door, is it? I looked out through it, thinking of my bedroom door and my apartment door beyond that. It's not about the literal entrance to the room you're in. The rotating light below began intensifying as whatever was out there approached our hiding spot. His panicked grip on my hands told me I was right. Then why do you lock real doors, Eddie? I shook him until he looked at me despite his fear. Is it a metaphor? Does it make you feel better? Does it close them off somehow? Why isn't it working this time? He began to cry, sending mixed drops of tears and sweat onto my forearms. I couldn't take it anymore. I'm tired of the constant struggle. The high cliffside curb where I'd picked him up flashed through my mind clear as crystal, and the fear that had been building since the moment I saw him wake suddenly left me. He'd gone to that cliff for a reason, and he'd probably had second thoughts as he stood there, alone in the dark. Completely calm, I asked. Your car didn't break down, did it? He shook his head. You messaged everyone, didn't you? He nodded. And I was the only one that responded. He rocked back and forth in front of me. I just couldn't take it anymore. They want in. They're always out there. They want in. I always lock them out, but they never stop. I'm tired of being terrified every minute of every day. The air began moving under the door as the lights reached peak intensity outside. Whatever it was, it was almost upon us. There's nowhere to go, Eddie. Let's open that door. Maybe you're constantly terrified because they want you that way. Let's face them. Let's be unafraid. And it just might work. He didn't respond, but I dragged him to his feet. I'd never wanted to do anything less in my entire life, but there was nowhere else to go. With a firm grip on his wrist, I reached forward with my free hand, unlocked the door, and flung it open. I don't care if you don't believe me. That's not the point. But I'll tell you what I saw. The lights 
were eyes. They were bright enough to obscure the grotesque, moving body beneath. I still can't understand how it was spinning like that. Snake-like curves connected things in shadow. Every blazing pinpoint swung up, flashed us with images of hatred and fear and paranoia, and then continued past, moving on too fast to process. That was the thing. The images were lies. My girlfriend was cheating on me. My teachers at school had thought of me as a failure. My boss hated me and had only put up with me because he hadn't found a replacement yet. But each individual lie raced past too quickly to pick apart and resist. I knew they weren't true, but they just kept coming. At the heart of the creature, I sensed a hunger for fear. I kicked a wide, grasping mouth away and jerked Eddie out with me, getting a few feet past whatever the hell that thing was. It turned toward us again as I flung the bedroom door open. I'd been right about the door handle turning, that much I knew in that instant. The madly spinning shadows and light failed to illuminate the beast that lay beyond that door. Immediately, I knew the thing behind us was just a servant to this, because this was so, so so much worse. The only thing I truly registered was a melted face. Its misshapen gaze seized the beating heart muscles in my chest and filled me with absolute terror as if it had the power to reach inside me and dredge out all the blackness and animal fear in the corners of my human soul. I knew these things didn't want into my apartment or bedroom. It wasn't so simple as that. They wanted into our world, and Eddie was some sort of conduit for that nightmarish goal. He always had been. I had the knife-keen, vicious sense that I needed to kill him immediately. But maybe that urge came from the emotions those creatures were giving off. As the sludge specter with the melted face began a rising scream that threatened to deafen me, I did what I had to do. I grabbed the heavy lamp from my nightstand and smashed my window clean through. I threw Eddie out a moment after and then pulled my arm from a burning grip of caustic acid to escape. I could only lay on the ground screaming as Eddie did the rest by dragging me away from that place. That was three weeks ago. The burn from the grasping hand of that sludge creature refused to heal. The doctors at the emergency room couldn't make heads or tails of it. Something had burned the shape of a melted hand around my forearm, and it continued to burn as they studied it. They could find no acid, no catalyst, and no heat. Eventually, they had to release me. Of course, their lack of understanding didn't lessen the hefty medical bill any. I parted from Eddie the next day, telling him to stay strong and remain unafraid. We'd beaten the forces of hatred and paranoia personified and escaped with our lives by charging through rather than hiding. He seemed unconvinced, and repeatedly said that we hadn't done anything, that I'd dragged him out of there, and that, without me, he didn't know if he could do it. But I have a life to live. I told him. Gotta pay off that ER bill and find a new place. He understood. Or at least he said that he did. Today, I saw Eddie again. He didn't know I was there because it was just a chance encounter on city streets. He was in a bar watching a television above and drinking a beer. I stood outside and watched him through the window for a moment, awed at the change. He was sitting with new friends. He was wry, confident, and completely ignoring the door of the bar instead of nervously looking at the entrance every so often. It was such a positive change that I actually went inside with a smile. But I stopped about ten feet behind him as... Over the noise of the bar television above, I began to hear what he was talking about. 
His words floated in the air with a nearly perceptible stench. Sludge dripped from the back of his sentences, burning the ears of those near his group. His new friends agreed happily and haughtily, replying noxiously in kind. A disgruntled customer nudged me as he passed. <sighs> Ignore these assholes. I turned away with misting eyes and walked out into the chill night. I hadn't saved Eddie at all. He'd found refuge not in standing up to those creatures, but by going down a path I hadn't even considered. I looked through the window of that bar one last time. The misshapen creature that had burned me with its touch grinned back from the shadowed corners behind the television. It found the entry into our world that it had craved for so long. I had unlocked the door. But it was Eddie that had let them in. I woke up later than I expected, the sun shining on my face through the only bedroom window not covered by a blind. Had Herbie not cried since... when? I sat up slowly and picked out the baby monitor. It was on, and I could see the black and white image of his crib, his small form beneath the blue blanket my mother had given him. I began to feel uneasy as I thought back to the night before. I... I remembered putting him down at 11 and then checking on him at midnight before heading to bed, but usually he'd wake me up between 3 and 4, and again between 6 and 8. I looked at my phone. It was 10.15. Had he really slept through the night for once? Or had I slept through him crying? Or was something wrong? Pulling back the sheets, I jumped up, my heart pounding in time with my steps as I ran down the hall to his room. The house was so silent, and when I went to the nursery, the instinct that something was wrong just grew stronger. The room felt empty and cold. Looking over into the crib, I was reaching out to pull back the blanket when I stopped myself. I could already see the rise and fall of his chest, and his face was unblemished by discomfort or bad dreams. He was sleeping well and peacefully, and here I was about to wake him up instead of being grateful for a few hours' peace. I was about to ease back and go make some coffee when I heard a funny little snoring sound. Herbie had never snored before, though I guess there was a time for everything, especially with a three-month-old baby. Still, I felt a new twist of worry. What if he was getting sick and that wasn't a snore? It was a wheeze. Wincing at the idea of disturbing him, I gently pulled back the blanket and picked him up. He didn't stir, his expression not changing from the placid mask of someone lost deep in slumber. This worried me more, as he normally woke up as soon as I touched him, but I held my fear in check as I eased my shoulder and put my ear to his face. It didn't sound like a wheeze, but it wasn't a snore either, exactly. It was thinner, more rhythmic sound that grew quiet and then louder, but was always there. Still thinking about congestion, I lifted Herbie up a bit and put my ear to his chest. The sound was clearer here, a whirring thrum that seemed to vibrate from somewhere in his core. That wasn't right at all. I needed to call the doctor and carry... That's when I felt the hard place on his back. My fingers had just brushed it, but the wrongness of it was immediately obvious. Under his onesie, right in the middle of his back, was a long, flat hardness that was cool to the touch. What was that? Lying him back down on his stomach, I pulled the onesie down as a breath caught in my throat. It was a coin slot. A metal coin slot 
like one you might find on an old-fashioned machine at one of those antique arcades or fairs. I reached down and touched the edges of it, thinking somehow it had gotten stuck to him, but no. It was flush against the flesh of the baby's back. Hard brass grown seamlessly into soft pink skin. My mind was reeling, torn between confusion and fear and the growing realization that Herbie still hadn't woken up. That's when I noticed the small gray envelope jutting out from a tangle of blanket nearby. Plucking it out, I felt the weight of something small and hard inside, and when I opened it, a thin silver coin tumbled out into my palm. Still in shock, I turned it over in my hand, studying it. One side was embossed with the face of a smiling woman, crowned with the corona of sunlight. The other side showed the same woman, her thin face hard and sinister as she glared up at the moon. My eyes went back to Herbie and then to the envelope, where I could see a thin line of cramped writing on the inside of the upper flap. This is better. It's coin-operated. I started to shudder, the envelope fluttering from my hand as I picked Herbie up again and began to rub his face and arms, his legs, his feet, desperately crooning for him to wake up, to get up now. It was time to wake up and quit playing this joke. But he just lay there limply in my arms, purring that strange, rusty sounding snore without stirring at all. I put him back down, tears blurring my vision as I tried to decide what to do. I should call 911. He must be sick, or I was crazy, and either way, we needed help, but. What if this was real? And what if using the coin fixed things somehow? I hadn't remembered dropping the coin, but after a moment of panic, I found it on top of the blanket, gleaming dully as I held it in my hand. This was all insane, like some kind of nightmare, but but maybe if I played by the rules, I'd wake up and everything would be okay. So I turned Herbie back over and tugged down his onesie once again. The coin slot was still there, still cool to the touch and solidly real. Holding my breath, I put the coin up to the opening and dropped it in. There was a muffled clink, and then the whirring snore grew louder for a moment before turning into a yawning sigh. Herbie turned his head and tried to push himself over as he began to wake. I let out a gasp and picked him up, looking into his face and finding his eyes. He was looking back at me, his expression drowsy, but interested as he gave me what might have been a slight smile. He was okay. He was okay, and I was just messed up, or... But no. The coin slot was still back there. And I could still hear a low-frequency whirring coming from inside him somewhere. Not the wet beating of a heart, but the dry orbits of an intricate clockwork. My skin went cold as I eased the thing back down into the crib. It tried to hold on to me, but I gently pushed its grasping hands away. I... I don't know what this thing was, but it wasn't my baby. Turning, I started out of the room. I'd get my phone and call my mom, and then I'd go looking for Herbie. Maybe he was still in the house, but I had a feeling it was gone. Someone had taken him and left that envelope, left that thing, and... Mommy? I froze. Turning around slowly as Herbie's face peered at me over the edge of the crib. How was that possible? It would have had to have jumped several inches and pulled itself up to the edge, and Herbie was a long time from being able to form words. Mommy! The tone was harder now, almost accusing. My baby's face was drawing down into a pouting frown. I felt anger mixing with my fear as I took a step forward. I'm not your mommy. Whatever you are, you aren't mine. The thing froze for a moment, and I had the thought that maybe it had broken or 
wound down, but then its cheek jumped as it began to pull itself over the edge. I am. I'm your baby. Grunting, it tugged its belly up over the railing and flopped down onto the ground. Despite myself, I felt a moment of horrified panic that it had hurt itself. A moment later, the panic turned to terror as its limbs rotated with a whir and it flipped itself over and began to crab walk over to me. Come hold me, mommy. I was backpedaling now, trying to close the door before it reached me, but it was too fast. Leaping forward through the closing rack and landing on my chest, it squealed in my face with a sound like grinding gears and sparks glowed from somewhere down in its throat. Screaming, I grabbed it and slammed it into the wall and then the floor before kicking it away from me. The meat of it was ruined now, the fleshy covering ripped and torn in a dozen places to reveal bits of gleaming metal and coiled wire, gears and axles flailing disconstantly as their places in the orderly hole were disrupted and destroyed. It was dying now, but even still it called to me, crawling to me, as it clicked together pink gums made of thin strips of beaten tin. But... Oh, me, I, 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 I am your b b baby n n n now. I was terrified to approach it, but my revulsion and rage was growing again, and I needed to make sure it was dead and it stayed that way. Darting forward, I stomped on it once, twice, and then a final third time, and that's when the silver coin popped free from the mechanical ruin, rolling down the hall a few feet before spiraling and falling down, the evil face of the Moonlight Queen glaring up into the sky, or perhaps towards me. I was half crazy as I searched the nursery and then out of the house for Herbie. When I saw no sign of him, I called Mom, screaming and crying into the phone before hanging up. I'd upset her, but it couldn't be helped. She sounded as confused as I was, but I felt sure she'd call the police like I asked. I had other things to do. I thought I could go back and look at the recorded footage from the baby monitor, see what had happened to Herbie and when. My hands were shaking as I picked it up from beside the bed and tapped on the screen. It always kept the last 24 hours, so I jumped back 10 hours and then started fast-forwarding through the footage. I found what I was looking for at 3.15. A pair of small figures appeared from the shadows in the far corner of the room. There was no door or window there. So, I wasn't sure where they'd really come from, but I was more concerned with what they were doing. Helping each other up, they pulled themselves over into the crib. One of them scooped up Herbie, even as the other was opening a dark sack and pulling his replacement out onto the bed. Weeping, I watched as Herbie began to wake and struggle, a tiny furred hand covering his mouth before he could let out a frightened wail. The other had placed the blanket over the fake and was now opening the sack again, even as the one holding my baby stuffed Herbie inside. In a moment, they were back over to the side of the crib and gone into the dark. I dropped the monitor onto the bed and ran back into the nursery to check it. Maybe there was a hole in the wall or a secret door, something I could use to follow wherever they'd taken my baby. I just needed to check every inch of the nursery. Except, it wasn't a nursery anymore. The room was bare. No crib, no toys, changing table, no stacks of books or a rocking chair. Even the walls were the stark gray they'd been when I'd first moved in two years before. How was any of this happening? Stumbling back into the hall, I saw the ruined baby thing was gone too. 
There was no sign of its broken bits or torn disguise. There was no sign of anything, not even... The coin. My heart leapt as I saw it, still dully gleaming from its resting place on the carpet. The woman's face still harsh and displeased in the silver moonlight of some distant night. But that didn't matter. What mattered was that it was proof. Proof of what had happened. Proof that someone had taken my hurt. I let out a small scream as the doorbell rang. The police. They were here and I could show them the coin and the video and they'd help me get my baby back. When I opened the door, I saw it was my mom instead, her face drawn and pale as she looked at me. I... Brenda, are you alright? I stared at her, incredulous. Of course not. They took him. They took him and we have to get him back. Did you call the cops? Her face drew down further into a frown. No. No, honey, I didn't. You weren't making any sense. You were talking about a baby? What baby? Stepping back, I felt a chill run up my spine. My baby, Herbie. They took him. She followed me inside, shaking her head slightly. Baby, I don't know what you're talking about. You don't have a baby. You never have. I could barely breathe. That... That's not true. I have a baby. Little Herbie. What's wrong with you? I started to cry again. They... They took him, and they, they tried to trick me or trade with me. They gave me a little mechanical baby that looked like him, but it wasn't him, and then it attacked me, and then I saw them take him, and the room was a nursery, but now it's not, and I need you to know this. I need you to remember and help me find him. My mother stepped forward and swept me up in a hug, stroking my hair as I wept against her shoulder. There, there. I know you're sick, honey. We need to get you some help. It'll be okay. I'd wrapped my arms around her neck, but now I started to recoil. How could she not remember him? I was still pulling away when my fingertips brushed against something on the back of her neck. It was a coin slot. I froze, staring at her as she smiled at me, her eyes jumping slightly to the left and right as she watched me, holding me tighter with the softly ratcheting clicks of some internal metronome. This is better. Just accept it. She was too strong for me to push away, so I dug into my pocket instead. I found the coin that rested there. I caressed the queen's cheek as I pulled it free and reached around its neck to the coin slot embedded into whatever it called the spine. I saw its eyes widen as I dropped the coin in. And then it began to scream. Small trigger warnings before we get into the final story. This one involves some instances of implied self-harm, some instances of violence against young children, and it's just overall quite a gross and kind of intense story for those who are squeamish. So if it's not something you want to hear, just click on to a different video and check that one out. But for anyone else still here, wanting to hear the story, Let's jump into the final story for tonight. Mother, do I have to? I remember like it was yesterday. Sitting in the living room, the flower sack towel stretched tight over the hoop in my hands. 
I had stitched my way through letters A, B, and C. I had pricked my fingers seven times and had to undo no less than fourteen stitches. I hated embroidery. Sybil, we've been over this. It's a Wayne family tradition. Every woman in our family has learned this skill since... Well, since as long as I can remember. Now it's your and Olivia's turn. I scowled down at my crooked letters and uneven stitches. Why doesn't Jacob have to do it? Because, she sighed in exasperation. Because that's just how it is. Okay, finish two more letters and you can go outside for the day. I perked up at that and returned to my handiwork, stabbing the fabric with a little more force than necessary. Just five minutes later, I finished D and E with sloppy, crooked stitches. I presented Mother with my sampler. She held it inside. I made her sigh a lot those days. Oh, Sybil. I wish you would take this seriously. Why can't you be more like your sister Olivia? Olivia was on the opposite side of the couch, her posture perfect, not a hair on her head out of place. She'd only stitched A and B, but they were perfect, every stitch done in precise alignment. I was clearly lacking in that department. I preferred torn knees and climbing trees to stitching. Olivia kept a collection of porcelain dolls meticulously arranged about her room. I had a collection of my own. Worms. And a makeshift box full of soil hidden under my bed. It was easy to see who the favorite was. It bothered me, of course. It's hard for any child to know that they're favored so much less than their sibling. But I wasn't willing to give up my happiness to be the perfect daughter my mother wanted. So I abandoned my embroidery and ran out the front door to search for my older brother Jacob and see if he wouldn't play catch with me. Olivia never even looked up from her work as though nothing but that thin line of thread was of any interest to her. I never got any better at embroidery. My stubbornness won out over my mother's instructions. I only ever learned how to do the most basic running stitch. Olivia, of course, mastered the art. Backstitch, blanket stitch, French knot, lazy daisy, woven wheel, and more. Nothing was beyond her grasp. Embroidery became her world. She never sewed much interest in the other things Mother offered to teach her, but it didn't matter. She'd learned the one thing that mattered. She successfully carried on the Wayne family tradition. And then my baby sister came along. I was 11. Olivia was 12 and Jacob was 14 when Margaret was born. Suddenly my mother's world shifted and all that mattered to her was the baby. I didn't mind much. Neither did Jacob. We were used to her ignoring us, but Olivia? I remember the look on her face as mother dismissed her time and time again. I watched Olivia watching mother fawn over the baby, the cold shock in her eyes, the tightness around her mouth. I could almost hear the thoughts screaming, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough anymore. I don't know how to make her feel better. The distance between us has only grown over time. She was my sister by blood, but she didn't feel like a sister. She was like a stranger living in the same house. It felt too strange, too uncomfortable to reach out to her and ask her how she was faring. So I didn't. I took the coward's way out. I pretended nothing had changed. But it had. And soon those changes became impossible to ignore. As mother grew even more distant, Olivia threw herself into embroidery. Like she could gain mother's favor by crafting a perfect piece. Her room was overflowing with projects. Pillows, blankets, dresses. Her art grew more elaborate and evolved. She went from an expert to a veritable genius. Even I could look past my jealousy and resentment and see that she was truly gifted. But Mother never even noticed. 
One day, I came to Olivia's room to tell her supper was ready, only to see her carefully organized projects in complete disarray. She'd begun embroidering over her own designs, her bedspread, the cloth bodies of her ragdolls. If she could stick a needle in it, she was embroidering it. What are you doing? I asked. She didn't answer. She'd never been very talkative, but after Mother's abandonment, she hardly spoke at all. By the time Margaret was one year old, Olivia had only gotten worse. My mother hardly took notice of her still. I thought that Olivia would come to accept it after a while, that she'd fallen out of favor. Her room was a mess of thread, every viable surface stitched into oblivion. There wasn't a scrap of fabric left for her to use. It was shortly after she'd run out of room that I noticed her arms. She was sitting out on the porch one morning, her stare listless and vacant. She didn't notice me approaching. She had, she might have thought to cover the marks. Olivia, I gasped when I saw her arm. What is that? What did you do? Her right forearm was a mess of pinpricks, oozing blood that stained her skirt. She scratched at the marks faintly, her fingertips coming away stained red. I've been practicing, she murmured, not bothering to look at me. You did that to yourself? I asked. I need practice. She insisted as though it was the most natural thing in the world. A vision flashed in my head then of Olivia threading a needle and pushing it through her skin, fastening a satin stitch over and over as the blood dripped down her arm. Before I could think of anything else to say, she stood up and went back inside. That night, Father asked if I'd noticed anything strange about Olivia. Even though he was hardly ever home, traveling most of the time for work, I was still surprised it had taken him this long to notice something was amiss. I couldn't look him in the eyes as I shook my head. I didn't say a word. Margaret was 18 months when she disappeared. Mother had woken up one morning to find that she was missing from her crib. She tore apart the house, searching for the baby, screaming her name. All of us helped, even Olivia, who had shaken off her stupor enough to realize something terrible must have happened. Within the hour, the police arrived to ask questions and began a search. They elected to find father first. A man should know his own child is missing, the officer said. He told us all to check the house one more time, probably just to give us something to do. After all, if she was still in the house, we would have heard her crying. Father came home that afternoon, escorted by the police. They questioned him and then all of our neighbors. They checked the yard for footprints. They put together a search party to comb the woods behind the house. Us children were sent to our rooms, and I could hear Mother sobbing in the living room while Father comforted her. I sat on my bed awake for hours. I was certain the police would come to the house soon. They would tell us they found Margaret and that everything was okay. They, they had to. But as the night wore on, so did my patience. My eyes began to droop, my mind began to wonder, and soon I was fast asleep. I woke early the next morning. As dawn was just creeping over the horizon, the house was silent as I cracked open my bedroom door. I warred myself for a few months, trying to decide whether or not I should leave my bedroom to face what the day might bring. I decided that I couldn't stomach the thought of sitting in my room for a moment longer. I crept out into the hallway, afraid of breaking the stillness of the morning. As I passed Olivia's door on my way to the stairs, I heard her voice, pitched low and humming a familiar tune, a lullaby mother had sung to us as children. 
Curiously, I twisted the doorknob. Olivia? I called in the loudest whisper I dared, pushing the door open to see if she might come with me downstairs to wait for the rest of our family to wake up. She looked up at me and smiled for the first time in over a year. Hello, Sybil, she said. Her face was covered in blood, and so was her nightgown. In fact, it looked like her entire bed was drenched with it. Sitting beside her was her embroidery kit, complete with needle, thread, and scissors. She was holding something in her arms. Come and see she said, completely oblivious to my rising panic as I tried to make sense of what was in front of me. I inched my way closer and peered into her arms. It was so bloody that I couldn't comprehend what I was seeing at first. Then horror began to dawn on me as I recognized my sister's perfect little embroidery stitches. Stitched right into someone's flesh. The little body was covered in satin stitches, pulled tight through skin. The mouth had been sewn shut. The eyelids, too. Isn't she beautiful? cooed Olivia can't be what I think it is, I thought. Olivia, what have you done? She shook her head and giggled a little, as though I'd said something amusing. (laughs) It's a gift for Mother. Do you think she'll like it? She asked, peering up at me through her dark lashes, but I only had eyes for baby Margaret, or at least what was left of her. The rest of the story goes a little something like this. Olivia had taken Margaret out of her crib early in the morning the day before. She brought her to her room, laid her on the bed, and smothered her with a pillow. Then she'd taken her baby doll out of its little carriage and placed Margaret inside instead. Since Olivia had taken upon herself to search her own room, nobody noticed the difference. That night, as our parents cried in the living room, as Jacob and I were drifting to sleep in our bedrooms, Olivia pulled out her needle and thread and turned a little Margaret into something else entirely. Her final masterpiece. My parents discovered what she'd done the next morning when my screams woke up the entire house. I'd wish I'd had the presence of mind to wake my father, to tell him what Olivia had done, to spare Jacob and mother from seeing it with their own eyes, but I didn't. And they suffered the worst shock of their lives. My mother never recovered from it. She was hysterical clutching Margaret's body to her chest, screaming like some kind of wild beast. She was hospitalized and sedated after the police arrived to take Olivia away. She didn't make it another week. Her heart gave out just a few days later. My mother died of a broken heart. Father couldn't bear the sight of us children after losing Margaret, Olivia and mother. He sent Jacob and me away to live with our grandparents, people we'd hardly ever spoken to and who treated us as strangers intruding their home. I'm not sure when my father died. Three, maybe four years after the murder. Nobody would tell Jacob and me what happened. Knowing my father, I suppose he drank himself to death. Jacob joined the military as soon as he was old enough. He promised me he would come back, that we would stick together as the only two left of our tragic little family. 
he died overseas just two months after leaving. I left my grandparents when I was of age and became a secretary. There weren't many positions for women back then, but I was good at typing and that was enough. I lived on my own for many, many years until I met my husband. We chose to never have children. It was the only way I could live the rest of my days in peace. But what of Olivia? Olivia lived out her days in an institution. She received no visitors, at least none that I know of. I haven't spoken to her since the day I discovered she'd murdered our sister. I've been in contact with some of the nurses and doctors, but only by necessity. I know very little about how she spent the rest of her life. I don't know if they ever let her touch a needle and thread again, although I imagine not. I don't know if she came to regret what she did, if she really understood what she was doing at the time, if she was born rotten, or if it was something that happened over time. I could find these answers if I wanted to. Because, you see, ever since my grandparents died, and the burden of maintaining contact with Olivia's doctors fell onto me, I've been receiving letters. Once a year, always dated on the anniversary of Margaret's murder. Olivia's letters arrive at my door. I've never read a single one. This is the first year I haven't received a letter. That's how I knew she was dead. Even before the doctors called to notify me, when they called, I told them politely but firmly that they could burn her and dispose of the ashes as they wished, and I never wanted to hear another word on the matter. Then, I opened the box I kept under my bed, the box with all the unopened letters I received over the years. I took them outside, and I burned them. I'm an old woman now, the last surviving member of both my mother's and my father's families. I haven't much time to live, I'm sure, but I can't find it in myself to mind much. As long as I know that damned Wayne family tradition dies with me, I'll be able to rest in peace.